Well, Craig, I, I know you and I talked about th this topic uh, recently. I think I mentioned to you that I first heard about telemedicine visits uh, at D Farm like three or four years ago. Never had a chance to experience it until this year in May when I had a checkup and suddenly it was done uh, over my cell phone. I can tell you from that experience, I am not going back. And I, I'm sure a lot of patients in, in trials feel the same way. I, do you think telemedicine, is that going to be a huge part in, in trials moving forward? Ed, you know, I think your observation is 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 very prudent here. That all of us are having these kind of uh, digitized virtual experiences in 2020. Um, it's how our kids have been going to school, how we're seeing the doctor, how we're getting groceries. And for many of us, it's a new experience that in some cases seem to work. Maybe it doesn't do everything we wanted it to because a lot of it got rushed in terms of implementation. And so it's for that reason that so much of what we look forward to is a little more around personalization and hybrid and choice in so many of our studies. If a patient uh, prefers to use a video visit for a particular encounter and the protocol can support it in terms of the procedures that are required, how do we best introduce that as a choice for them? And if that same patient would prefer to see the investigator because of the high touch positive experience they have when they go in, or maybe because of a concern, maybe they have noticed some swelling in an extremity and they have a concern that they'd like to show. To have those types of choices in how we design and execute our studies, to me is the, is the most desired future. It's not one of fully virtual versus hybrid versus otherwise. It's one where we can afford choice for people. The implementation challenges that Michelle just spoke about regarding telemedicine are, are very real. Um, I think that the worst scenario that many of us experience in many cases is around bandwidth. I experience it regularly because while I'm here talking to you about using it in trials, my wife is in the room next door seeing patients using video. And half the time I can hear her trying to help them to troubleshoot. But most of the time it, it is resolvable. I think this topic around home health is a really important one. It's one that I've heard a lot of concerns from different sponsors in recent years about how do we best manage the quality when we're dispatching um, resources into the home that are representing our study, maybe the investigator as well. One opportunity that many should consider is how to best incorporate, as Michelle was pointing to, including your technology with the home visit and perhaps making sure that your investigator is still a part of that home visit using video that's scheduled concurrently. And so there are some ways to leverage technology and integrated platforms that can help mitigate some of the implementation concerns and keep investigators an active part, even if it's a visiting nurse in the home. And Jeff, anything else you wanted to add to that? Yeah, a few thoughts. You know, we're a, I don't know, we're a society where the pendulum always swings pretty radically. And I, I think in the case of, you know, telemedicine, whether it be for healthcare or whether it be for trials, um, I, I think we need, you know, to, to be somewhat cautious here. Um, there are a lot of things you can do over, you know, telemedicine. And I think it's very encouraging that it's being reimbursed in the healthcare system that will just continue to fuel the utilization. Um, you know, just being maybe a little challenging, I, I think when, you know, we start talking about optimizing a trial for a patient and if they wanna go to a site, they can go to a site or they can have a televisit. Um, you know, I, I would say if there are any statisticians um, tuning in here, their hair is probably up on the back of their neck because we have to make sure we're not uh, unintentionally introducing bias into our trials. And the last thing I'd say is, you know, human beings need interaction with other human beings. You know, I, for years, you know, I hear people talk about, you know, the younger generation today, and that, in my case, that can be many, many years younger. Um, but, you know, how people are, are texting now and kids can be, you know, in one physical space and they're texting with each other and they're not talking to each other. And that's true. But when you also see the same group of people interact, you know, when they're not texting, the, the engagement that they have with one another is really rich and really caring and they're really uh, present with one another. So I think while telemedicine will play a role, um, I still think the desire of human beings to be able to, you know, sit down with a physician or a nurse practitioner, an investigator, 
and that physical touch and that eye to eye, you know, in person contact uh, is something that uh, is truly needed uh, by all of us. And, and, and Debbie, and, are you yeah, able to hear us? Yeah, I was going to. Uh, yeah, I was going to add a point to that. I think that's really important, um, Jeff, because I, I'm just going to be honest here. My husband loves to go to our doctor. He loves it. They have a golden retriever. It's a husband and wife, nurse practitioner, doctor. He loves to go. If I never saw them again and could use telehealth, I would be, you know, the happiest woman in the world. It's choice. It's options. It's, you know, again, we have to be cautious of that data integrity and what are our endpoints and what's fit for purpose based on the trial outcome. But I think the more we can think about offering patients the freedom to have, you know, clinical research a part of their life and not necessarily a part of their schedule, I think the more successful we will be in getting these products to market sooner. And so that flexibility and recognizing what your patient needs, but also what your study endpoint, your biostatistician needs is incredibly important. And again, has to start at the the, the concept and not necessarily, you know, unfortunately many of us in, you know, COVID in the middle, but we have to figure out how to do that for our patients moving forward. Um, so Debbie, I'm going to stick with you for the next one. Um, Tina asks about um, the COVID and post COVID landscape and enrollment to clinical trials. Um, and, and Audrey just asked a really good question too about, about patient enrollment as well. As, as 2020 comes to an end and, and we start moving into 2021, what, what are you seeing in that regard? Uh, we're seeing a little bit of difference depending on therapeutic area, quite honestly, um, depending on certain, you know, conditions, you know, patients being more apprehensive to go to visits, et cetera. On the flip side of that, we did do an analysis of looking across all of our trials, laying over COVID-19, looking at the red, green, and yellow of where are all our clinical sites, what has enrollment been over the year, et cetera. And truthfully, there wasn't a lot of difference between what was green for a good part of the year versus what was red versus what was yellow. Um, so... 2021 is going to be very interesting as one, the vaccine, obviously vaccines um, come to light, but also two, I think this is a real opportunity for industry. These patients who have participated, I shouldn't say patients, these participants who have participated in the vaccine studies should be our heroes. Here's an opportunity for industry to say without these individuals stepping up and participating in a clinical trial, we would not have the outcome of Pfizer, Moderna, and hopefully others. So I think we've got an opportunity to really message that and hopefully that level of education and awareness to individuals about clinical trials and the parameters that are put in place to help keep them safe will actually help all of us moving forward. 